here I go. <laughs> um, is, uh, the title is, of course, uh, Is a New World Coming? Is there a different way to look at the state of the world today? Rather than watching the world coming apart, are we instead participating in a consciousness revolution that will change humankind? I ask you to consider looking through the lens of possibilities this morning rather than endings. New research, points of view, ancient knowledge, and even common sense understandings are telling us that something very important is happening. Um, throughout the reading today, I will give a quote now and then from my very favorite handbook called Illusions, Reminders for the Advanced Soul. And uh, here's an example of um, what, what those will sound like. Everybody came here with a design o life personal future construction kit. Not everybody remembers where they put it. I start this morning with a story that comes from a TED YouTube talk given by author Elizabeth Gilbert in March of 2020. This incident happened in May 2019 to a woman called Amanda Eller. Miss Gilbert visited Amanda Eller sometime after the event. Amanda was still recovering from her journey into the unknown, and she told Elizabeth about her experience. Amanda became lost in the wilderness in Hawaii, having left her cell phone and purse in the car, and she stayed lost for 17 days, surviving <clears throat> alone. During that time, um, Amanda endured many scary close calls. She walked off a cliff, she broke her leg, she lost her shoes in a flash flood, she had to pack herself in mud to protect from the cold and mosquitoes, and she survived on wild berries, mud, and stream water. It was truly a harrowing story of survival. Meeting Amanda, Miss Gilbert was surprised to see that Amanda was lit in radiant wonder and joy long after her experience. Miss Gilbert asked Amanda, how are you like this? Amanda reported that on the second day in the jungle, when Amanda realized that she was truly lost, totally alone, and nobody knew where she was, she became truly terrified. She closed her eyes and she prayed, or she made a wish, or she spoke to herself, or she spoke to the cosmos and she said, please take the fear away. And when I open my eyes, have it be gone and have it not come back. Amanda opened her eyes to find that the fear was gone and that it had been replaced by intuition. From that point forward, Amanda did not experience fear for the rest of her trial in the forest. She was guided only by a gut feeling, a deep sense inside located somewhere between her sternum and navel, Amanda said. She would ask her to intuition, right or left, up or down, eat this, don't eat this, and completely surrendered to the intuition of the moment. The fear has not returned, and Amanda continues to guide herself by her intuition. In early 2020, everybody in the world had his or her life upended. Routines have gone out the window. Just as I began to wonder about the larger meaning of the chaos that we'd landed in, I heard something very helpful. Author Carolyn Miss said something striking after people began to quarantine, and she said, 
I have often wished that people would just stop in their tracks, slow down the hectic pace, and have enough time to assess their true purpose in life. I had never thought about, though, what it would take to do that. Suddenly, COVID-19 hit, and bingo. In the blink of an eye, the world we've always known is gone. And we sit today wondering when, how, and if we will ever feel normal again. Talk about a fear and stress situation. Unease has exploded across the planet with no end in sight. Again, these words are care of uh, Elizabeth Gilbert, and I quote her observation about humans. There are two aspects of humanity that define us, Ms. Gilbert said, but they do create a paradox. First, we are the most anxious species on the planet. Unlike other animals, we can think independently, we can recall past events and imagine a future, uh, many futures in fact. Life also tells us that this is a very difficult place in which to live. And add to that, we learn very early that anything can happen, it can happen anytime, and it can happen anywhere. Second, the paradox of our anxious species is that we are also the most capable, resilient, and resourceful species on Earth. When change comes, we are really good at adaptation. Most of us are pretty good in a moment of crisis. And when the point of change comes, we can handle and adapt in the aftermath. For example, just recall the story I told you about Amanda Eller. Handbook quote here, you are never given a wish without also being given the power to make it true. You may have to work for it, however. Here's a little brief experiment I'd like to ask you to do. And there we go. <clears throat> and what I'd like for you to do is I want you to think about this question. And I'll for 10 seconds, um, I'll let you have to think about the question. And I'll uh, watch the time. The question is, if you thought of a pause, oh, excuse me. What has changed for the better since COVID-19 began? 10 seconds. <clears throat> okay. If you thought of a positive change, have you thought about how that change is better? And could it be a permanent change in thinking? There are many ways to view this crisis. People now have a distrust of government. They're tired of all the news hype and they question wasted money and time on important stuff, unimportant stuff. Before though you resort to the uh, philosophy of the sky is falling, the sky is falling, consider that our generation does have a bit of help. There is almost unlimited information available at our fingertips. One creative idea is to scroll major network stories looking for real news tucked underneath the gaudy headlines. Here are three jewels of news that I found when I started putting together this presentation. Point, families have begun eating regularly, eating their meals around the dinner table. A surprise for many households, families find that they like it. Their children report being calmer, 
and feeling like they are heard. Second point, credit card companies are becoming uneasy. Fewer people are using their credit cards for casual spending, choosing instead to pay down their credit card debt. Third point, young adults begin to resemble the old hippies of the 1960s. They appear to be a driving force. They have marches and they're vocally protesting injustices. Unlike the 60s though, this time, older adults, professionals, veterans, even parents are joining in the marches. Maybe this is a good time to discard some of our outdated beliefs. And do remember this too, change can happen very fast, both personally and worldwide when we are motivated. Handbook quote again, any powerful idea is absolutely fascinating and absolutely useless until you decide to put it to work. With the breakdown of routines during this pandemic, people are beginning to turn to their own communities for support, not the government. There are thousands of positive new things happening in counties, neighborhoods, among friends, families, and neighbors. Just consider being creative with innovation. Just look around your surroundings, take a hike, have a serious listening session with a child, or daydream. You can find solutions anywhere. Another area that shows promise is science itself. There are many aspects of science that are beginning to combine themselves with other disciplines and researchers are creating whole new branches of science. And I'll tell you uh, just a few. The first, brand, the first one I'll tell you about is called synthetic biology. And that involves uh, architecture, physics and botany. This research makes new inventions by studying how nature does it. The example is Japan has studied roof root development in mushrooms to design better subway systems in Japan. Exometeorology, that combines astronomy, meteorology, geology, and it's mapping weather patterns off the planet. It's finding very strange anomalies that affect what we understand about the laws of the universe. The next area is epigenetics, and that includes genetics, psychology, and biology. Science may actually have found a real basis for an old Iroquois principle that was so important to the Iroquois Confederation that it was included in the Iroquois Constitution. That principle said that decisions made today will affect seven generations into the future. Geneticists today are finding what they call DNA tags on some living people that express characteristics that seem to be a holdover from an ancestor who had trauma. Here's an example. There are ongoing studies in Israel with descendants of Holocaust victims, and they find that there are tags on specific genes that cause a modern day person to display abnormal behaviors, hypervigilance, overreactivity to sudden movement, and paranoia about uniforms, 
as well as other traits that are not consistent with modern life, but certainly were understandable on a Holocaust grand or great grandparent. And the last one I'll tell you about is called economic circular strategy, which combines ecology, economics, design, biology. It also has a nickname, donut strategy. That nickname came from when uh, they are talking about it and um, they do drawings up on the board and the shape is always in a circle when they do it. <clears throat> the city of Amsterdam, Holland is leading the way. They're dedicating their entire city to the project. So far, these are some of the programs that they have begun. They are vastly cutting down the use of new materials. They are creating food and organic waste streams. They're drastically reducing wasteful consumption and they're finding creative methods to recycle waste. They're also changing to circular construction in a variety of places like neighborhoods and shopping areas and highway design. In fact, the European Union has even begun looking at donut strategy for road systems throughout Europe. And finally, the thing that it really struck me with donut strategy is that it totally eliminates the GDP model. GDP is gross domestic product and it has for a century been the model that is used to measure progress in the industrialized world. Donut strategy will measure ways to live in harmony with the planet, not unlimited growth and consumer economics. Handbook quote again, <laughs> argue for your limitations and sure enough, they're yours. Here are a couple of common sense ideas that are often overlooked or discounted. Developmental biologist Bruce, Dr. Bruce Lipton says, not just biology, but thoughts are also needed to be changed in order to cure any illness. Negative and violent thinking leads to bad health. Energy is vital to the human body. We are, after all, energy beings having a human experience. When one dwells on defeatist beliefs, it drains energy that could be better used elsewhere for healthy body maintenance. Second point, one of the biggest sources of violent thinking is your own thoughts. Dr. Marshall Rosenberg, creator of nonviolent communication workshops, clearly pointed out that some of the most negative forms of violent communication that we have is conversations with ourselves. Here are a few examples of some of this self-talk that you may be familiar with. Well, that was a stupid question. Why do I always mess up? Ooh, boy, I screwed that one up. I'm an idiot. You get the picture. How we live our daily lives and how we think really matters. Rather than focusing on the present moment, we live in beliefs that were made a long time ago. That's called living in the past. Or we're fearing the worst. That's future thinking. The only place that we can change a bad habit is in the present. When you are berating yourself and catch yourself, mentally say, stop. Tony can tell you about that. 
stop and reframe the thought immediately on the spot. Doing that also retrains your brain to not play old tapes. It is miserable for the body to live with self-sabotage happening daily. We all, though, do have two important talents. All of us have these. And we often take them for granted. The first one is humor. The second one is perspective. Humor is defined as the quality of being amusing or comic. Humor brings happiness and it's good energy for the soul. Norman Lear was the creator of situation comedies like All in the Family, The Jeffersons, and Maud. And I'm quoting him here. He said this, I believe my longevity has depended a great deal on the amount of laughter that I've had in my life. You know, I love thinking about this. I could cry thinking about this. You stand behind an audience as I did time and again when Archie Bunker was at his funniest, let's say. When an audience laughs together, every seated person tends to rise up and out of their chairs. Then they go back down and then they go back up again. And if there's anything more spiritual in our life than an audience moving on a belly laugh, well, I mean, that's praying, that's gratitude. That's enjoyment. I personally put humor right up there with the traits that I most admire in others. If life is about learning, nothing says you have to be serious all of the time. When you're having an exam, when you're having an argument, for example, try to see the funny side of it. Is it really that big a deal? Besides, if it's really important, you know when to be serious anyway. The second talent we all have is perspective. And it's very important. Perspective is defined as the way you see something. Seeing life as a half empty, which is negative, glass, is very different than a glass half full, which is positive. And it influences literally everything you do. Jean Houston is a scholar. She's also a philosopher, a researcher, an author, and one of the foremost visionary thinkers of our time. Jean told a story from her childhood that she says introduced her very early to a healthy perspective. She was very precocious, probably because of her dad's job. John Houston was a comedy writer for Bob Hope, George Burns, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy and more. Jean was not the least bit shy and she said, in New York City in 1942, I was five years old and I attended kindergarten at Albert Einstein School. Jean's teacher took her class on an outing to one of the city's largest auditoriums to see Helen Keller give a speech. Jean was absolutely enthralled with Miss Keller and she just had to meet her, she said. At the end of Miss Keller's talk, Miss Keller's assistant asked the audience if there were any questions, and Jean's hand immediately shot up. Without waiting to be invited, Jean just ran down the aisle and she climbed the stairs to the stage and she stood there and she just stared at Helen Keller. The assistant had to ask Jean twice what her question for Helen was, and Jean said, there I stood without the slightest clue what I might ask. And finally, 
Jean just blurted out the first thing that came into her head. Well, why do you smile all of the time? When translated for Miss Keller, there was a look of confusion on Helen Keller's face. There was a brief pause. And then Helen began to laugh so hard that her assistant had to hold her up. It was quite a sight to see a real belly laugh from a blind and deaf person. Helen Keller then um, uh, finally get herself recovered and um, contemplated the question. Miss Keller then translated the following information to her assistant. I'm not sure, but perhaps it's because I live each day as though it was my last. Jean said that that information affected her profoundly. And it was very precious knowledge indeed, coming from a very wise person. Cartoonist Gary Larson had a lot to say about humor and about perspective. Here is an example that he used in one of his cartoon drawings. The subject of this Larson drawing is also, <laughs> it's a, a favorite of my delightful fisherman husband, Jim. The cartoon is a picture of two lumpy men, poles in hand, sitting in a dumpy fishing boat on a nondescript pond. It's obvious the two fellas have just spied something over the mountains. And the caption reads, I'll tell you what this means, Norm. No size restrictions and screw the limit. Jim Sarneski would tell you that these fellas had the right perspective. You didn't tell them what they saw. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. That what they saw was three mushroom clouds on the other side of the mountain. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. Um, and now we are on to the next handbook quote. Imagine the universe beautiful and just and perfect, and then be sure of one thing. The is has imagined it quite a bit better than you have. A paradigm shift, transformation, new world coming, course correction, change of awareness, new age, changing times, shift of the ages, call it what you will. Many bright and thoughtful people believe that extraordinary changes for all humanity are no longer coming. They're happening right now. And if this is so, it does beg the question, will I change enough to meet this brave new world? Here are just a few closing thoughts from talented writers, scientists, statesmen, and philosophers who are searching for meaning in these extraordinary times. Before I tell you the first one, I have to define a word because I had to look it up. It, the word is crucible. And crucible means um, a situation that leads to something new, okay? And the quote is, this is a crucible moment. Second quote, growth only comes through change. Third quote, we're becoming more open to having extraordinary abilities. Another quote, evolution is always moving onward and upward. 
Another quote, what we believe to be possible defines what we are capable of creating. And last, from visionary Dr. Jean Houston, and yep, this is the little girl who met Helen Keller. And this is what Dr. Houston has to say about this time in our lives. We can hunker down in fear, or we can look for the opportunity to care, each in our own way. Remember, our kindness is a light. The more we extend it, the brighter it becomes, and the more darkness we illuminate. This is our time. Perhaps this is an initiation. And on the other side of it, we will look back and realize that we were part of an epic time in history when caring triumphed over fear and goodness prevailed.